One. Hey, everybody. Welcome to day three of our conversations on the tools of high magic. Today, we're talking about the pentagram. Okay. Now, when we're dealing with the pentagram, it is a symbol of the earth in witchcraft. It is a symbol of man. It is a symbol of the unification of different elements and the different patterns in which they can be applied. So between Eastern magic and Western magic, we have a variety of things that we can look at when we apply things in a pentagonal order, right? And so as you're doing the blazing ritual of the pentagram or the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, where you visualize and you call down the holy archangels at each of the points and you make your, your directions of the points in different ways, you evoke that energy from that location of the star in its rotation, right? So down in the bottom left to the, to the upper right, over and across, depending on which direction you go in Chinese magic occurs in different ways, right? And we'll get into that in a little bit, but right now I wanna read a passage from the Transcendental Magic Book by Elphis Levy. As it provides for a deeper dive into the pentagram and its high magical associations. So he begins, it begins as the chapter nine, oh, sorry, chapter five, is the blazing pentagram for the rites of transcendental magic. It says, we proceed to the explanation and the consecration of the sacred and the mysterious pentagram. At this point, let the ignorant and the superstitious close the book. They will either see nothing but darkness or they will be scandalized. The pentagram, which is the Gnostic schools called the blazing pentagram or the blazing star, is the sign of intellectual omnipotence and autocracy. It is the star of the Magi. It is the sign of the word made flesh. And according to the direction of its points, this absolute magical symbol represents order and confu or confusion. The divine lamb of Ormus and St. John or the accursed goat of Mendes. It is initiation or profanation. It is Lucifer or Vesper, the star of the morning or the evening. It is Mary or Lilith, victory, death, day or night. The pentagram with two points in its ascendant represents Satan or the goat of the Sabbath. When one point is in the ascendant, it is the sign of the savior. The pentagram is the five figure of the human body. Having thus the four limbs and the single point representing the head, a human figure head downwards naturally represents a demon. That is intellectual subversion, disorder, or madness. Now, if magic be a reality, if the occult science be really the true law of the three worlds, this absolute sign is the sign ancient as history and as more ancient should and does exercise an incalculable influence upon spirits set free from their mental envelope. The sign of the pentagram, called the sign of the microcosm, represents the Kabbalists of the Book of Zohar's term for microphosphorus. The complete comprehension of the pentagram is the key of the two worlds, its absolute philosophy and natural science. The sign of the pentagram should be composed of the seven metals, or at least traced in pure gold upon white marble. It may be also be drawn with vermilion on unblemished lambskin the symbol of integrity and light. So you can use uh, lamb vellum for that. Um, the marble should be virgin, that is never has been used for another purpose. The lamb skin should be prepared under the auspices of the sun. The lamb must have been slain at paschal time with a new knife and the skin must be salted with salt consecrated by magical operations. The omission of even one of these difficult and apparently arbitrary ceremonies makes void the entire success of the great works of science, right? And so we're incorporating in the application of the pentagram in this case that you are creating something very, very specific. You are establishing the life of that individual entity, creating the parchment from its skin, creating those aspects of it represents a very deep and potent form of the work. So this is, this is where sacrifice offerings becomes part of the tradition of the ancient church, right? And so we'll continue. The pentagram is consecrated with the four elements. The magical figure is breathed upon five times. It is sprinkled with holy water. It is dried by the smoke of five perfumes, namely an incense of myrrh, aloes, sulfur, and camphor, 
to which a little white resin and ambergris may be added. The five breathings are accompanied by an utterance of the names attributed by the five genii who are Gabriel, Raphael, Aniel, Samael, and Ophiel. Afterwards, the pentagram is placed successively at the north, south, east, west, and center of the astronomical compass, pronouncing at the same time, one after another, the consonants of the sacred tetragrammaton, and then in an utterance to the blessed letters Aleph and the mysterious Tau, united in the Kabbalistic name Azoth, right, which is the alchemical representation of the union between the mercurial salt, the sulfur, and the blood in order to be able to replicate the lapis philosophicorum or the, the philosopher's stone. The pentagram should be placed upon the altar of perfumes under a tripod of its evocations. The operator should wear the sign also, as well as that of the microcosm, which is com comprised of two crossed and superimposed triangles. So that would be the star of David. In other words, the, the point of triangle up and the point of triangle down overlaid. When the spirit of light is evoked, the head of the star, that is one of its points, should be directed towards the tripod of evocations and the two inferior points towards the altar of perfumes. In the case of a spirit of darkness, the opposite course is pursued, but the operator must be careful to set the end of the rod or point of the sword upon the head of the pentagram. We have said that the signs are the active voice of the word of will. Now the word of will must be given its completeness so that it may be transformed into action and a single negligence re representing an idle speech or doubt falsifies and paralyzes the whole process. Turning back upon the operator, all forces thus expended in vain. We must therefore abstain absolutely from magical ceremonies or scrupulously and exactly fulfill them all. All right. So if you screw up your tools are rendered ineffective they have to be ritually destroyed and you must begin again this is without question right so if you make an error on a piece of parchment that you're trying to draw this is why i always say have extra make extra ink make sure that you've got like your precision down because if there is even a single error in the flow it doesn't function and the pentagram engraved in luminous lines upon glass by electrical machine exercises also the great influence upon the spirits and terrifies the phantoms. Excellent. The old magicians traced the sign of the pentagram upon their doorsteps to prevent evil spirits from entering and good spirits from departing. This constraint followed from the direction of the points of the star. Two points on the outer side drove away the evil, Two points on the inner side imprisoned them. Only one on the inner side held good spirits captive. Although these magical theories based upon one dogma of Hermes and on the analogical deductions of science have been confirmed invariably by the visions of the ecstatics and the paroxysms of the cataleptics, declaring that they are possessed by spirits. The G, which Freemasons place in the middle of the blazing star, signifies gnosis and generation. The two sacred words of the ancient Kabbalah. It also signifies the grand architect for the pentagram on every side represents an A. By placing in such a manner that these two of its points are in the ascendant and one is below, we may see the horns, the ears, the beard of the hierarchic goat of Mendez when it becomes a sign of infernal evocations. The allegorical star of the Magi is no less mysterious pentagram than the mysterious pentagram, excuse me. And those three kings, the sons of Zoroaster, conducted by the blazing star to cradle the microcosmic God are themselves the full demonstration of the Kabbalistic and magical beginnings of the Christian doctrine. One of these kings is white, another is black, and the third is brown. The white king offers gold, the symbol of light and life. The black king presents myrrh, the image of death and darkness. The brown king sacrifices incense, emblem of the consolating doctrine of the two principles. They return thereafter into their own land by another road to show that the new cultus is only on a new path, conducting man to one religion, that being of the sacred triad and the radiant pentagram. The sole eternal Catholicism of St. John in the Apocalypse beholds the same star as it fell from heaven to earth. It is called absinthe or wormwood, and all waters of the sea become bitter. 
a striking image of the materialization of dogma, which produces, produces the fanaticism and controversy. Then unto Christianity itself may be applied the words of Isaiah, how hast thou fallen from heaven, bright star, which was so splendid in thy prime. But the pentagram profaned by man burns ever unclouded to the right hand of the word of truth, and the inspired voice guarantees him to overcome the possession of the morning star, a solemn promises of promise of the restitution held out to the star of Lucifer, right? And in this case, the star of the East, the star of the absolute and the universal synthesis opens up human aspirations to the 50 gates of knowledge, right? And so that's through the epiphany, through the different applications of it. And so if you're using the pentagram as a key to open up the different aspects of creation, you're doing it to invite that energy into man, right? And if you go through and you look at the different pentagrams of Solomon, the different pentacles of Solomon, right? The images inscribed upon the sacred disks that are prepared and suffumigated in specific ways so that those virtues of the plants can be transferred into the metals and those shapes can be imbued with the divine names of God or the divine names of angels or the infernal names or whatever they are that you're summoning, again, a symbol without errors. So that way, that is a perfect vessel for the spirit to be anchored to. So we get into the nuance of the pentagram, right? It's like, it's not enough to just draw something on a piece of paper. It's the consecration. It's the entire event that goes into the creation of this experience. So Levy is rather dogmatic in how he approaches the subject, right? Now, we all know that if you're out on the road and you have to grab a Sharpie and draw some sigil of some sort onto something in order to protect yourself or to change the direction of energy or to change the outcome and all of those things, it becomes very possible and mm -hmm. errors are present, but the full manifestation of it becomes weakened as there are gaps in the circuit, so to speak. And so the less gaps there are in the circuit, the easier it is to go and make new things possible. There's also the book of uh, the books of Moses, the sixth and seventh books of Moses, which contain the different talismans and the astrological placements of those language rooted talismans. And they're called pentacles. They're called these things that draw forth those energies specifically. And the way that they're drawn, the inks that they're drawn in, the time of day that they're drawn on, the hour of the day and under the astrological influence of the time of year actually matters. Why? Because you're calling upon the energy of the angle in space. You're not calling upon something that is metaphorical. It is very tangible. It is a very visceral energy. And so... Mike, you've had experience drawing out these sacred shapes. You drew one the other day. What is your take on that? I did. I did draw one the other day. Lovely. Let me get it right, right side up. There we go. There we go. That's fantastic. It's all in Hebrew. And now what's it say around the Hebrew gate? Oh, you're gonna make me. Yes, I'm gonna make you. You're gonna make me. You're gonna make me say it. Uh, let me sound it out. Patak et ha ashar bin ha alamo alamo rope means uh, open the gates. Between the worlds. Nicely done. It's got all the fancy little worlds and things you told me to put on there. That is correct. Yeah. And the, the reason why is because not only do you get the vibration of each of the letters representing a specific type of energy in its union, but you also get the focus place of the division between the worlds in the same kind of way that in the Kapothic traditions or in the Kabbalah traditions that the divine had to create Geburah as the place into which the world was created. God had to divide himself from his creation so that he could create a place where he was not so it could propagate its own divinity. And that's so we, the thing. For those that are out there that are artists, you can get really creative with this stuff. Like 
now. That, that's freehand, guys. I didn't use rollers and like all kinds of shade. That that was freehand. So I was just looking at a picture and going to it. I'm all about doing it by rulers and such. Yeah, but... see, I, I can't. I as you see, I'm all tattooed. I, I was a tattoo artist. I can't can't do rulers and such. Now I, you know, and it's funny because you know I can't measure anything out when I'm drawing, but boy, let me get to cooking and I got to measure everything. <laughs> I, I'm I'm the opposite. It's like if I'm cooking, I got this. I got this. But yeah, no, like measure measurement is important because you know, and this is one of those things is where you want to make sure that your symbols are mathematically sound. Because again, it's about the perfect representation within that object, within the microcosm. You, you can have those placements be a, a degree off and your spell won't manifest in the way that you want it to. It'll be a little bit shaky. It'll be, the, it'll be a little bit more rough on the client, as it were. And the better we do when it comes to drawing these things out, lining them up accordingly around a specific grid, the less chaotic it becomes, right? And in my work, when I'm doing the different aspects of these things, I've got a mineral in the tip. I've got a plant. I've got the animal. I've got a quality that represents the spirit and a quality that represents the mind in these things. Now, the application of those within the space, if I'm using a five point star, like you can put the elements, you could use the Chinese elements of wood, air, metal, wood, water, metal, earth, and fire, right? Um, and they each have a relationship to each other. And depending on how that relationship is applied, it depends on what types of work manifests. And that's what I'm looking for right now. It's just this book is hiding it from me. Uh -huh. Don't you love when they do that? Right? Magic books want to tell you what they want to tell you when they want to tell you. It's just I'm not you know, sure. or chopped liver compared by comparison. Um, it, Almost as bad as a cat. It's, I, would, I would venture to say worse in most cases because it's like, oh, <laughs> I forgot that that was even in there. <laughs> like, and I remember that spell. It's like, okay, well, that's no. And so again we'll go into making the arrays while i continue to search for this particular chapter can't find it yet no i feel stupid yeah, <laughs> stupid i feel doing this uh no um it's like it's in here here's the math for it that's where in, in the beginning you should always highlight in, the, in like the reference part chapter highlight it i did all the ones you go to a lot highlight it that's what this i do like highlight it I have, but the problem is, Mike, I've got in this so many little flags of what's highlighted. <laughs> it's like, which flag did I use for which? Okay, That's, so now you got to pick through the highlighting. Yeah, now I need to take a sharpie to these little flags and be like, all right, this is the pentagram page. This is the, this is the other page. You have to do the Dewey Decimal System on, on, on the colors. <laughs> I really am, man. I know, you know, I had it listed at, at, at some point. It's just, it's all within the hexagram stuff, and there's so much of it. As you would expect. Right? So, like the sky and the yang, its color is white, its ingredients are for the sun, right? And then you've got the earth, the lake, found it. Ha, found it. Earth, lake, fire, thunder, wind, water, and mountain are the, are the eight arrangements, okay? Now, Eastern culture pentagram, metal is on top. Wood is on the left, water is on the right. Bottom left is fire, bottom right is earth, okay? If you're doing counterclockwise, so metal, wood, fire, earth, and water, that will generate things for love that will draw out the inner the inner nature of a thing because you're creating a spiral of flow if you're doing something that's pentagonal counterclockwise it creates fear all right and so that means metal to fire wood to earth fire to water earth to metal so you've, you've got metal fire 
water, wood, earth, metal would be right. the, the fear-based pentagram. It would be the, the, you're drawing in dark energies from it. You're drawing it down from the metal, right? Like the severity of the metal. For creation, you're doing it clockwise. So it would go metal, water, earth, fire, wood, and back to metal. So everything goes back together, right? And if you're doing pentagonal clockwise, so metal, earth, wood, water, fire, metal, back again, is destruction. So you can use this as the destructive pentagram. So if you need to break energy down, bam, like that's what you get. The hexagrams um, that are for use for the pentagram of love would be hexagram number 35, number seven, number five, number 44, and number 37. For fear, it would be hexagram number 13, number 20, number 64, number 11, and number 48. For the destructive pentagonal clockwise, it would be 12, 59, 14, 46, and 63. And for creation, all right, that's the clockwise pattern. That's number six, number 36, number nine, number eight, and number 50. And so when you're using those arrangements, when you're using these ingredients of the hexagrams, like which one represents which, right? You, we have in the, the Kabbalah, the, the concept of earth of earth, earth of air, fire of fire, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the wind of wind is hexagram number 29. The fire of fire is hexagram number 30. The wood of wood is hexagram number 57. And the lake of lake is hexagram number 58. The metal of metal is the hexagram number one. And the water of water is hexagram number two. Thunder of thunder is hexagram number 51. And mountain of mountain is number 52. So we have 51 and 52, one and two, 57, 58, 29 and 30 as the primary, this is what they are in their foundations, right? And so you have the yang state and the yin state over each other. And depending on which nature that you want, you can have yang over yin or yin over yang. So that energy receives and projects or that energy projects what it receives, right? And so it's a mathematical principle, again, where you put your symbols within the pentagram depend on what you'll be able to result yield as a result of that. So that way everything matches in balance and it stays in harmony with the divine rhythms that you're talking about when you're creating energy in and energy out. So if it bonds a spirit in, then it's because of the divine names that you've put there. And so it's creating projective energy out. So you put your energy into the thing the thing then creates the resonance within your space and puts it out. And so this is why I like to work with the hexagrams is because those are an environmental manipulation. One of the fun tricks that you can do with studying the hexagrams in order to test them and to apply this technique in different ways to your, your symbols and your objects and things like that is to draw a tarot card for an individual to see what their energy is like and to see if it matches their, their particular place, right? And then you take a Sharpie, body safe, non-toxic or what have you, or you take watercolors, whatever they are, and you draw a hexagram, one of the symbols of the I Ching on either their foot or on their arm or wherever you want to have some fun with it. But draw a tarot card again. And because of the environmental impact that overrides the conditions of whatever the environmental energies are, that hexagram is the meaning that you'll pull in the tarot card. And this has happened every time I've done that. So it's pretty cool how the, the environmental manipulation occurs using this Taoist technique, right? And so when you're doing Taoist magic, they recommend that you do it on a yin yang with equal spaces, equal circles, with the, the black circle and the white circle, everything with an equal measure. Right. And so it's on this rug or on this stone carving that you're doing the star stepping patterns. You're stepping between one gate and another. You're literally doing this on a carpet. You're doing this on a surface that is a plane that is created by the magic that you're creating and inviting into your space. So that way you have a place of evocation. You have a place of communion. You have a place between this world and the other worlds. There's a, a monastery here. It's the Presidio um or the prado excuse me uh and it's it's one of the first missions here in san diego and they have part of it where it's an elevated platform and on the top you go up this little creepy set of stairs 
and there is a brick pentagram with its thing that the monks used to worship on outside under the stars it's creepy as shit really cool <laughs> but it's a historical landmark it's one of the first places that people came to settle in san diego when california was founded um by the spaniards that came up so when they set their mission up they also included a pentagram that was out under the stars everything in equal alignment everything lined up and this is where they're doing their holy work this is where they're blessing things this is where they're consecrating things right so it becomes a really interesting connection between the pentagram and sacred symbols of the church not just as the crucifix right Whereas if you wanted to get technical, the, the symbol that they should have over the altar is the single point upraised five point star, not a crucifix. Technically, if Just we're like going to be Jewish people have. Exactly. Started, as above, so below. Exactly. And the unification of the, the micro and the macrocosm. So those churches with the synagogues that have the hexagram over the doorway. Fantastic. Absolutely correct. Oh, as the two towers, Boaz and Yaakov or something like that. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's like when, when you're, that's the, 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 the pillars of severity and mercy, right? And so when you walk through the gates, you're walking the middle pillar, right? You've got your, your pillar on the left, your pillar on the right, and you go through the doors, your temple space opens up. And and it's, black and white floor and the ladder. Jacob's ladder. Yeah. That, that's right. Get me going. Get me going. <laughs> hey, dude. I mean, this is what this is what high magic does. Is it connects people to the divine. It connects people to the Im impermanent forces of the earth, the the day to day, right? With the permanent forces of the celestial heavens, that which comes from a specific hour, that which comes from a specific name, that which comes from a specific vibration or intonation. And so that way, as they get to go through these things, they get to experience these things firsthand, mm -hmm. it becomes more tangible so that as people are calling upon the holy pentagram or they're calling upon their symbols, like with what Alex was describing in our conversation in the last class last week, where he named, he, he called it an arc, right? And he was uh, basically using different aspects of what the pentagram represented, consecrating a piece of wood to hold that energy so that we, when he used it, you could, he could use it accordingly, right? And so if you want to get really technical, you could put a pentagram that's made out of a wooden disc in each of your five places and in the center, and you can complete the circle, right? And so when you've got a, a coven of witches that are standing out there in each of the quarters, each of them spread to the arms out open, the legs out open, their head pointed straight up, and they're chanting down for that, that quarter or that space or bringing in that element to that circle, they're bringing in these energies specifically in the same kind of pattern, right? They're becoming the living embodiment of the pentagram. They're drawing in the balance between what is on their left hand, what is on their right hand, what is below their right foot, what is below their left foot. And it's the way that they channel that energy up and through them around the core of their body, up and out and into their cone of power as they develop that as their ritual space to create that ritual circle, to create that divide between the normal world and the abnormal world, right? That which is mysterious, the phantasmagoria, right? The spiritual world, right? So creating that rift in the body. So when you assume the gestures or the positions, right? You're mystical yoga right this is this is what yoga does is it allows your body to maintain positions and channel energy through it in different kind of ways think about for those of you that remember the rabbit ears on the top of the tv when you had to wiggle the rabbit ears to get them just ever so right you know for the, the modern kids won't ever have any idea of what the fuck i'm talking about but you understand mike that's what yoga does, is it positions your body, lines your body up in such a particular kind of way that you can channel the energy from one hand into the core of your being, into the earth, into the heavens, into the environment that you're using in. So that way you become an extension of that energy that that position is representative of, right? So not only is it really great for your muscles and all of that, but it's also an invocation. It's an invocation. 
you're pulling that energy through your body physically. And then you're releasing it into the environment, right? You're either discharging it through meditation, you're doing ritual work for it. And that's one of the things that Crowley would do is he would do the different yoga positions during and before his ritual work, right? And even afterwards, there's symbol, there's, there's arm gestures, there's leg gestures, there's body positions that you take when you're doing these kinds of things. So that way they get the effect that they're looking for. They get that outcome that they're looking to use. They, they, they get that medium of transference from the intangible into something physical that outputs into the material, which is the entire path of the four worlds of the Kabbalah, right? Your intangible mind, you're forming it with your divine thought, you're giving it action and you're giving it creation, right? And so as you go through and you use these things and as you catalyze upon these things, with the inks and with the colors and with the minerals and with the animal parts or with the sacrificial magic that Levy was talking about, right? When you make everything right in your ritual, you have then created the vessel that contains the spirit of that thing, right? Imperfect vessels, imperfect spirits, fallen spirits, lost spirits, damaged spirits, broken spirits, whatever they are, you can purify them. Granted, the better of a craftsman you are, the more time and effort you become in unison with this energy, the easier it is for you to be able to take on these energies and to be able to develop that communion with them. So that way your pentacles of Mars or Saturn or Jupiter or Venus and all of the different myriad forms in the greater key of Solomon have that vibration capacity because they're carved, they're cut, they're made in a very specific way at a very specific time of day, blessed with a variety of incenses and perfumes. So that way, once it's done, you consecrate it, you feed it, you put that vital spirit into it and you have an object of power. So, I mean, that's basically the 30 minute short version of what a pentacle of magic and of various power and properties can do. Do you have any questions so far, Mike? Did I miss anything? Am I forgetting things? Not really. Anytime I drew a, a pentacle, it was usually to step inside and do some magic. Yeah. Yeah, that works. Candles on each point, you know? Yeah. Um, I put the elemental seals where I do. I would, I would have the, uh, the four elements in the, the eight point star with the, the Hindu tatwa with the, the color mm -hmm. candle sitting on top of it in each of the points with the spell in its apex pointed at whatever direction I was conjuring stuff from back before I had the alchemical anchors that I use now. Um, and that's the thing guys, is that you don't have to have the shape of a pentagram. It doesn't have to be a five point star. It can be any right. shape star. It can be any space that's a ritual construct. So that way, as you do a thing, these are the things you're incorporating into it. So it's either the collections of the holy names of God. It's either at the right angles of the compass that you're trying to pull in to that energy. So that way you're getting that manifestation accordingly. So the way it works, right? It's a compass. A, a pentagram in the right conditions will sum it up God itself, right? And like this is the sigillum de Amath, right? This is John D's Enochian magic. In the very center, there is the pentagram. And then around it, you've got the seven point star. And then around that, you've got, you know, all of the holy letters, right? And so the different names of the different angels and all of that. And then you, on top of this, you put your scrying crystal, you put your incense, and then it goes into the scrying surface. And then onto that, you'd be able to project whatever it is that you need to in whichever one of the eight yeah. is to transfer your consciousness between the planets. Yeah. Beautiful. The sacred name of God, Yod Heh Wah Heh, Yahweh. Exactly. And then you got, you know, if you want to get into the separate side of it, the dark magic, then you just transfer it over to same thing, Hebrew, but with, you know, seven. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's, it's like as you work with these kinds of things, as your practice expands, 
working in the different capacities of the unification of energies and the elements. Right? It doesn't have to be those resin plates that the witch shops like to sell because they're flashy or what have you. Pentagrams are made real ones, like the ones that for your working out of wood, out of vellum, on leather, carved in metal. If it's made out of plastic, if it's made out of uh, that gross poly resin or whatever it is, shit doesn't carry vibration. It doesn't have the capacity to store energy. It just looks cute on a shelf. And so when you're using it for high magic, it has to come from either the natural world or the animal world in order to be able to carry the life within it because it's the life of the tree that was. It's the metal of the, the genus Loki that was. It's the spirit of the animal it came from. And so if you've got a pentagram flesh carved into you via a tattoo, then your body becomes the temple for that spirit. Your body, you're anchoring that energy into your body. And so that way you have that foundation for your body is the temple. You have blessed it and you have consecrated it and you have given it the holy symbols of those things, right? And so on my back, I have a conjuring circle that I call the circle of creation. Uh, and I found its exact patterning. I didn't know this. Uh, but the way that I drew it out, the layers that I included within it, I found in a copy of the Sefer Yetzra about five years after I got the thing tattooed on my back. It's because this is the path of creation. This is the path of formation that I'm walking on, right? And so this is what I conditioned the body for to be a conduit of these energies. And so in those situations, if this is a life path, then absolutely do that. But if you're just doing a pentagram to be like your local witches, you know, if it doesn't have the significance, if you're not using it to cultivate your body as a temple for the greater energies, and you're just doing it to be edgy, for sure. you've, you've, you've lost the goddamn point, right? And that's the thing is like you earn your tattoos, you earn every in single bit of ink you put on your flesh. If yeah. you don't, it shouldn't be there. It's not like you get drunk and you're like, oh no, I'm just going to go get this image. It's like... One should know what the image is first. Right. How to work with it. Understand it. Yeah. And that goes that goes into the magical tribalism of tattooing, not just the flash media art. Like it's if you're gonna get a wolf tattooed on you, do you work with the wolf spirit? If you're gonna get the bear tattooed on you, do you work with bear spirit? You know, it's those kinds of things. If you're getting pop media cartoons like i know this the a, a buddy of mine he's got a uh, myrtle snow tattooed on him from american horror story he's got a version of elvira tattooed on him he's got you know it's like that's cool because you're pulling the spirit of that character that spirit of those behaviors that you want to incorporate in your life right that's there's nothing wrong with that nothing whatsoever wrong with that but if you're going to go into the magical tattooing, if you're going to make your body, if you're going to really embody what it is to be that flesh crafted magician with tattoos and with permanent media, then consider those energies, consider the shape of those energies, consider the ritual time, consider the significance of the day, right? Are you getting it tattooed on your birthday? Are you getting it tattooed under a lunar cycle? So those are all the considerations that you need if you're going to be flesh crafting your body to become as the blazing pentagram. And then under the same conditions, the studies of Sakyant, uh, the, the Thai magic, where they do the, the prayers and the symbols and the images of those critters on the body. There are certain taboos that the individual who's wearing that can't break or they break the power of the spell that's chanted during that tattoo and they're surrendering it ineffective for the rest of their life. So it's like, you've got one shot, they tattoo it on you, you break the conditions of the spell, there is no recharging it, unless you go That's back right. and get it redone. Like, and even then you're gonna have to get another one. You're gonna have to get the whole thing blessed and prayed over. And they don't use electrical guns for those. They're doing it with the old school tapping in the, 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 it's a process. Like you're in pain, you're in endorphin rush, you go through all the cycles, like, so conditioning your body under the right kind of way 
is the same kind of thing that you have to consider when you're making a talisman. You have under the right kind of divisions of these things. It's like yesterday I was making the, for February 22nd, 2022 at 2.22 PM, I finished a talisman that blended the, tal the letters of the sun, the letters of Jupiter and the letters of Mars together because at 2 AM was the power of the sun at 2 PM was the powers of Jupiter on the day of Mars. So it's a union talisman between those three energies. And so being able to use okay. that to be able to draw that image again, I can bless it on that singular image, right? It, it allows for that image to have that power to come through or any of the other gates and arrays. And so using array magic, creating ritual circles that you can use over and over and over again, such as the use of this image, right? So this is one that I use regularly. And I'll put the alchemical anchors in each of the three circles. And that's a blood seal in the center of it. So it's through that gate. It's got the associations with the planet of Earth in there. It's got the associations of the spiral of flow in, this, in silver in there. It's got the herbs to open the gates of the Earth in there and the gates of heaven in there and the gates of the human path and the gates of the ghost path so that everything comes through its center point and represents it's a point of origin, right? Whereas something like this opens the gates of human, earth, and ghost with the gold gate of heaven. So focusing that energy into the center allows for that development. And so as you go through and you build out your practices in the same way that Mike has built out his practice with that summoning symbol for the spirits and the gates between the worlds, right? That's, the, that's one of those things where you can go a little bit deeper. That's one of those things where you can get a little bit more robust with your pentagram experience when you're creating a holy image, where is the zero point of your spellcraft? So that way there is a specific point of entry of where that energy comes out of and where that energy is going into that you use as a focus for your spell work. So with that, my friends, I'm going to say that ends the conversation on the holy pentagram so i appreciate you sticking with us thank you so much mike thank you and if you've got any questions please feel free to reach out and not really i know a lot about the pentagram i've done my my, my research and i've used it quite frequently i use it a lot in the kabbalah you know oh absolutely so as above so below as as within so without it's the holy i mean Really, it's, that's why the Jewish people have it. They tell you it's the star of David, but really it's not. David didn't have a star. Um, when you get into the Jewish Kabbalah, it, it's actually yod hey wah hey, and the Yod means fire, the hey means water, the Wav means air, and the hey means earth. It's, you know, as above. So it's, it's, it's all symbolic, but all fascinating at the same point when you, you start to understand it at these levels you under you give you get a greater appreciation for the pentagram when you understand the actual mystical sacred meaning behind it so um, and it's get it gets appropriated out into modern witchcraft or into wicca or into these like people that are like oh i'm just going to wear the pentagram as being an edgy yeah. thing and it's it's a sacred symbol right it, it it's more sacred than the cross but be, life. it exactly like, you know. okay for instance like carl sagan once said we are made of star stuff mm -hmm. only right the jewish people would have a star right exactly exactly and this is and i i can't stress this enough is like it, the star is in every major culture it's in every single like it's a basic it, building block of geometry it's you know it's us exactly <laughs> it's us i mean you know you, you can't you can't get around it anyway you look at it you're a star you're magical yeah and so is the, the better we can cultivate that the better we can cultivate the relationship between all of the different elements of our practice to create that singular focus of what we get to do the more tangible our material manifestations become the more those spells that you create for a client right you do the work for the client you set it up you get all your arrangements done you get the energy flowing from the seals into the totems into the symbols into their life through their physical material through the the 
the union point that you've created, and then it ripples out, and then they're getting to experience the benefits of the law of attraction or the law of narration or the law of formation and all of these different natural philosophies that are coming together as provable, tangible manifestations, right? Yep. So if you're trying to apply things like the law of attraction and you're having shit success with it, it's the elements that go into it. It's the, it's the understanding and it's the vibrations and principles and how they fit together that you have to study and know. So like the secret, yeah, it talks a big game. It's really literal, but if you don't have that foundation of, well, if you do it in this order, then you get results. If you do it out of order, you get bupkis, you get nothing, you get, it shit don't work. So we want your magic to work. We want your stuff okay. to manifest yeah. time and time again. So one spell becomes a system. It becomes a mathematical certainty. You do this thing, this thing will happen. Right. And you can modify it slightly by including somebody's life path, somebody's name sigil, somebody's physical material. And then because they're a different entity, it will occur in a slightly different variation because that energy is fixed, but it outputs through their energy, through their manifestation, through their acceptance of it. So if they refuse the manifestation of it, shit goes sideways for them because they fucked it off. That's on them. Yeah. The energy got brought into their life. That catalyst of change was invoked into their life. But how they went about using it, their interpretation of it, their understanding of it, because they didn't take the time to understand it, then they have a bad taste in their mouth. And then they say it's false. They don't understand that all of the different things that are applying in their life to get their life to go in that particular direction. You know, it's, it, it becomes devastating. And it's the lack of information. It's the lack of education on this. And it's the lack of willingness to embrace this information that causes more problems than it helps. And, and again, it's like what Levy said, you'll either get blasphemy or you're going to, you're going to be, you're going to be, you know, it's going to put you off. Like you're either going to just see evil or you're going to be stupid with it. Don't be stupid. Right. And that's the big lesson in this is like, if you're going to do a thing, make it as perfect as you can. So that way you've got a direct conduit for the divine because the divine is the perfect representation in the fallen, broken world that we live in, right? The more perfect you can make it, the closer to God it gets, right? And so that's why you seek the mastery of craftsmanship. This is why you seek the mastery of the old world in certain ways, right? Like the, the master masons and all of these things is because they had a perfect understanding of their craft so much so that they were able to reproduce it time and time again with little to no extra effort and it makes it look seamless. It makes it look as like the divine carved it themselves. And that's the kind of thing that the pentagram teaches, right? And so that's the, that's the same sort of thing that your talismata should represent, that, that you should be able to replicate in as much as you are able, right? And that's the thing, in as much as you are able. So that way, as you grow and as you get better, you've got a period of like the talismans that you made 20 years ago versus the ones that you're making today versus the ones you're going to make 20 years from now. All of them are improvements right and it's as the divine improves in your life your connection to it and all of these other things so remember folks don't be evil with this stuff right use it for the benefit of yourself and others around you and be safe with this information and i will see you next time for tomorrow's conversation look forward to it bye for now y'all <laughs>